Hello. So our official start to chapter two is going to start with power function. And we're going to learn what a power function is. Actually, something you've seen before. So it's where your base is variable x and then raised to power. So we're talking, um, you know, could be quadratic, cubic, quartic, quintic, and so on and so on. Um, this is the official form for power functions that we're going to be using. And then in the nearer future, we're going to talk about how we can use our calculators for power regression. And they can come up with a formula if we have, um, you know, not perfect data, we have to estimate using regression. So we also talk about a power function that happens to be a monomial function that can be written as um, f of x equals a for a constant function or a times x to the n, where a and n are non-zero constant real numbers. All right, uh, looking at some things out of your textbook, we have, a, all right, so if your n, your exponent is even, you have n behavior where the n's are going to go up in both directions. Um, we're going to talk later about polynomial functions and then multiplicity of zeros and things like that are coming up. So um, for this particular power function, it's a monomial expression where you're not going to have multiple factors and um, you will have multiplicity at the one singular intercept and you're going to look like this if your coefficient is positive it's going to be going up up and if your coefficient is negative your ends will be going down down so here's a bunch of information about like x-intercept y-intercept domain range i don't think it's worth memorizing these the only thing i would like you to memorize is whether you're um, degree of your function is even or odd and whether your coefficient is positive or negative. So if you have an odd degree power function, your ends will be going in opposite direction, like you see here. And if you have a positive coefficient, the left end will be going downward and the right end will be going up and then vice versa if you have a negative coefficient. So these aren't new concepts. Um, they're just gonna, I, I think your book refers to this as like the lead coefficient test or something if you're trying to determine a behavior of a power function. So this first example provides you a power function of one third x to the third power. So we have a cubic or an odd degree n behavior one with a positive coefficient. So without even seeing the graph, I knew it was going to do something like this. And this is the actual graph of it. Um, they provided you some ordered pairs off of a table. You guys have graphing calculators, so I don't really feel too bad for you. You could also manually plug in <laughs> all those numbers. That would not be very fun. But notice they gave you domain of negative infinity to infinity, range of negative infinity to infinity. That'll be typical of any odd degree power function. In this particular case, the intercepts are both at zero. And end behavior, um, it's that fancy notation for saying as it approaches on the left side, the function's going down, and on the right side, the function's going up. So this particular power function is increasing over the entire domain. There's never a moment where it's uh, decreasing or constant. So then um, they want to talk to you about whether it's even or odd. Uh, monomial functions with even degree also are even in the symmetry sense. I know that was a misconception from the last chapter where sometimes kids saw anything with an even power was an even function, but that's not necessarily the case. Um, but because these are monomial functions, there's no other like extra terms on the end. If you did the even and odd test, it would turn out that even degree is an even symmetry. <laughs> Um, an odd degree is an odd function with symmetry of the origin. All right, so this one is not done for us finally. So we would be graphing this, you know, getting a table off of our calculator. But I'm going to give you a incredibly, incredibly rough sketch here. Um, you know, I don't graph well even on a good day, and I'm on a tablet again today. So, ah, oh boy, okay, man, you know, it's not my day. <laughs> Switching to blue, that'll make all the difference, right? All right, so it, oh, geez. <laughs> it's a degree of four, which is even, so it is a positive coefficient. Both the ends are, you know, pointing upwards like that. It kind of resembles a, a quadratic function. This is, is a quartic fun function, technically, but a fourth degree power function looks a lot like a quadratic function. Um, the degree, or sorry, the domain is negative infinity to infinity, and the range starts at zero with a bracket and goes to infinity. They want to know about intercepts. Well, both the x and y intercepts are at zero. The n behavior, I'm going to shortcut n behavior because I'm just I'm so sick of writing it. <laughs> so I'm going to say 
y approaches infinity as x approaches negative infinity. That would be the left end behavior. And then y approaches positive infinity also as x goes to positive infinity. So that would be the right end behavior. Remember, end behavior can reverse as long as one of your lines is left and one of your lines is right. Um, continuity question, it is continuous over the entire domain, so check for continuous, yay it is. And then function is increasing versus decreasing, remember this is the ordered pair 0, 0. So this particular function is increasing from the domain interval of 0 to infinity, and it's decreasing from the domain interval of negative infinity to 0. Get them all? Nailed it. Alright, PS concave up if you're curious, <laughs> move it along. Um, this is referred to as a reciprocal function. So if we have a, what looks to be a power function but with a negative exponent, we have discontinuities because when you think about your variable being in the um, denominator, you're going to have you know a divide by zero situation and you're going to have some asymptotes. So keep that in mind when we refer to reciprocal functions, like for instance right here. So if I go ahead and I kind of take this x to the third power and throw it to the denominator, um, you don't have to, you can just type it in the way it was, but it ends up being 1 over 5x to the third. And if I graph this on my calculator, we're going to learn more about rational functions later on in this chapter, but you're going to see there's a, a horizontal asymptote at 0, yeah, 0, <laughs> and then a vertical asymptote at 0 as well. And then I just kind of pull some points off my calculator, but, you know, I don't, I'm not really interested in graphing too accurately today. It's been a long day. And then they want to know domain. So instead of doing the interval for domain, you know, negative infinity to zero, union zero to infinity, I'm okay for now if you just say x cannot be zero because that's the location of the vertical asymptote. Similarly for range, y cannot be zero. And if you think about algebraically, um, I can't have a divide by zero. There's also no way for this function to come out to equaling zero. That's why there's a y cannot be zero range, you know, discontinuity, if you will. And then intercept, there's actually none for intercepts. What's the other thing? Uh, oh, end behavior. So on the left end here, so we'll say um, the function is approaching zero. Can you tell it's going towards the axis as x goes, whoops, that got weird. x goes to negative infinity. And then over here on the right side, the function is also approaching zero as x goes to positive infinity. We'll discuss later about the horizontal asymptotes, but that's coming up soon. They also want to know continuity. This is discontinuous, so you want to say a little message about it being discontinuous at x equals zero, also at y equals zero, but the domain discontinuity is x equals zero. And then as far as increasing and decreasing, um, these are actually this function is never increasing, but it's decreasing. This is kind of weird because of the asymptote. It's decreasing from negative infinity to zero, union zero to infinity. At zero itself, there's an asymptote, so it's not doing anything. It doesn't exist. All right, then we have, um, what if we have a rational exponent? So remember our last lesson was working with rational exponents. We want to be careful about um, our function being in whatever form we need it to be. And then if we have a graphing calculator, it really doesn't matter what form it needs to be in. But if we're just kind of muscling through the question in our brain, sometimes you want to convert between the two forms. So just, forms. So just keep that in mind, especially if you're using like a non-calculator portion of the test and you have to just <laughs> use your brain. All right, so here um, I can pretty easily identify, you know, like if I'm square rooting a function, what discontinuities will show up, um, but when I go to graph a radical function, the more weird stuff that's under the radical is like the harder this becomes for me. So here's some examples of radical functions. By no means do I think you need to have exactly known in your brain what this looks like, and there will never be a time when I make you graph a funky weird radical function like this from memory, but the basic ones I think we should know. So if we have an even root, square root, fourth root, sixth root, it looks like this weird little aerobic side bend thing that has an initiation point, in this case at the origin, if it's not transformed. And then for an odd root, cube root, fifth root, seventh root, I would never ask you that, um, you have this weird little stretched out S shape. So just like with the power functions that were monomials with even and odd, 
um, degree, the even and odd roots have very uh, similar traits. So this particular one is an odd root. Normally I'd say it looks like an S, but notice how there's a negative in front that's going to reflect it. So, oh, yeah, you know what? It's, it's actually going to do something that's even more strange. If I go to graph this on the calculator, because of this quantity squared inside the radical function, it ends up like <clears throat> almost having like an absolute value effect. <laughs> so it looks like a square root on both sides. So I'm going to cheat because I've already kind of graphed this. Um, I know if I set this equal to zero, that means like something is happening there, like as far as x-intercepts go. So 2x plus 5 equaling 0 would be negative 5 halves, so negative 2.5. You know, something happens right here. And if I kind of cheat on my already graphed one, it looks something like this. I mean, it, it doesn't quite look like that because, I mean, it's me graphing it, but you get the idea. So domain, it's weird, but the domain is negative infinity to infinity as far as what I could plug in for x. So that makes sense because it's a cube root. Um, the range, however, if you notice, this ordered pair is negative 2.50. So the range goes from negative infinity to zero with a bracket, because there's a point there. Oh, intercepts, they're both, um, there are intercepts. So the x-intercept is at negative 2.5. Oops. Now the y-intercept would be like when you plug a zero in for y. No. Is that totally wrong? Time out, guys. Turns out what I was finding was the y intercept earlier. A little doy. When I was trying to find the x intercept, what I should have done was plug in a zero for the y. <laughs> so zero equals negative cube root 2x plus 5 quantity squared. So when I solve this, I mean divided by negative 1, boring. Uh, cubing is zero, boring. And then square rooting is 0, also boring. And then when you solve 0 equals 2x plus 5, oh, look at that. You get, ooh, negative 5 halves again for the y-intercept as well. And x-intercept, they're both negative 2.5. Sorry about that. Um, I'll show you here. Continuity. I mean, it is continuous. It's weird, but it's continuous. And then the function is increasing. Here, an increasing component, and here is a decreasing component. So increasing from negative infinity to, remember, domain, so negative 2.5. And it's decreasing on the other part of the domain interval, which would be negative 2.5 to infinity. What a lovely function. All right. Oh, we didn't do end behavior. I apologize. So end behavior. So the y values are approaching negative infinity as x goes to the left. They're going kind of down. And then the y values are also approaching negative infinity as your x's go to the right. This is a very atypical radical function. Um, there's a lot of weird things happening with it, like a reflection and then a weird thing that was squared inside of the square root graph. So, or the cube root graph, excuse me. So, <clears throat> nothing i would anticipate you doing without the use of a calculator so don't panic if you're like i don't know what that looks like yeah me neither i had to look it up too all right um a radical equation we have to be careful about when we're solving this and oh boy about to get real exciting guys <laughs> when we're solving radical equations we're going to do a lot of algebra there's going to be a lot of work and squaring and sometimes cubing um but we have to watch out for what's called extraneous solution that means it shows up algebraically, but if I go back and plug it into the problem, it might not work. So the main ideas are when you take an even root of an expression, if what's under that expression comes out being negative, like I can't take the square root of negative 10 and expect to have a real solution. So that's the cases where you're going to be. Now, <laughs> first example, big note, just watch. When we're doing this in class, like literally, I just want you to watch what's going on because this is going to get real gross and you're going to need a lot of root. So you out in you know, internet land, let's, let's just watch. We um, want to, you want to manipulate the equation so it has the least amount of problems possible. The idea is you don't want to have two radicals on the same side. And if you can isolate the radical so it's all by itself, awesome. If not, just make sure they're not together. So in this case, this is as like manipulated as it's going to get as far as making my life easy. So now I'm going to square both sides. <clears throat> and over here, this is great. Um, square rooting as, squaring a square root 
just gives me x minus 2 back. But this guy, this is different. This is a foiling question. Um, so I have two of these being multiplied together. So if you think about your multiplication patterns, this is going to save you some time if you can kind of shortcut it. So 5 times 5 is 25. And then I'm going to have negative 5 of these plus another negative 5 of these. So I have negative 10 of those. And then when you multiply this square root times that square root, you're going to get positive. And then the square root squaring, a square root, again, will cancel. You're just going to get a 15 minus x. And I change it to positive because of the two negatives being multiplied together. Now, I don't know if you noticed this, but this equation still has a square root. The good news is there's only one in the problem. So your next task is to get that square root completely by itself. Two, I see 25 and 15 added together would be a 40 minus 10 square root 15 minus x. And then did you notice there's still a minus x over here? But, uh, all right. <laughs> We're going to need to track 40. Oof. I'm also going to need to add this x over. So we have 2x minus 42 equals negative 10 square root 15 minus x. Now, sometimes kids are like, oh, well, shouldn't I divide by that negative 10? You could, but then you're going to have fractions, and I don't feel very good about having fractions right now. So I'm just going to go ahead, bite the bullet, and I'm going to square both sides. Now, this becomes, remember, we're foiling this out before x squared, and then I'm going to have negative, let's see, 84x plus another negative 84x, so negative 1. 68x. Let me double check my math. So I don't have to... oh, it's not even on my paper. Okay. Um, so negative. Yeah, we're good. All right. And then plus, oh gosh, 42 times 42. Help. No. All right. Got smart. Got a calculator. Okay. So 164. Oh, it's no 1764. All right, when I'm squaring the negative 10, it's just going to, you know, negative 10 times negative 10 is 100. And then when you square the square root, the square root just knocks off and you got a 15 minus x. Oh, why did I do this one by myself? All right, so we have 4x squared minus, I'm just going to leave this, you know what, forget that. We're going to rewrite this as 1500 minus 100x. Grab that. Okay. So I am going to go ahead and add this 100x over here. Very dangerous of me. I probably should do this. I'm going to subtract this 1,500. Woo. All right. <laughs> so back to my calculator, friend. I have negative 168 plus 100. I do that. That is dumb. All right. <laughs> negative 68x. And then 17, 16. Or again, why am I typing this? I know this. 264. I'm doing this on my calculator because I know I'm going to mess this up. Ah, oh, for Pete's sake. Okay, the good news is I think those will divide by 4. Let me double check. Looking good. Yay! So if I divide everything in this quadratic equation by 4, I have a much easier quadratic to solve. So I get x squared minus 17x plus 66. And then that's a really nice factoring quadratic. 6 and 11. So I get two solutions. I get x equals 6 and get x equals 11. So four years later, I have two solutions, but I don't know if they both work. If I go back to my original problem, if I plug in a 6, Right here, for instance. 6 minus 2 is 4. <laughs> and then square root of 4 is 2. Okay. And then if I plug in a 6 right here, that'd be 15 minus 6 of 9. And then 5 minus square root of 9 is 3. So 5 minus 3 is 2. So that one worked. What was my other solution? 11. Don't know until you try, right? 11 minus 2 is 9. Square root of 9 is 3. Okay, keep that down. Um, if I plug in an 11 here, square root of 4, which is 2. 5 minus 2 is 3. 
they both worked. So this is a case where I don't know if it's good news or bad news, but after all that hard work, we found out that this equation had two different solutions, 6 and 11. Now, some lessons I've learned in the past of solving these. We talked about not having more than one radical on each side. So if you happen to have two radicals together, if at all possible, please move one of them to the other side. I don't care if there's something else with a radical, but two radicals together is like really super bad news. Now, oh, man. Forward, Abruzzo, it was already worked out. I think it was even worked out. I don't know if it's on your paper or not. That makes me angry. Why didn't I look ahead? Hey, here's the good news. They got the same answers that we got. So I must have done something right. Okay. Here's some practice examples that um, I would love to go over. And in class, if we need more examples of these, I surely will. But I want to make sure we get to the questions that are on your um, notes page. This particular one is on your notes page and it's already worked out. In fact, they went through and they checked both the solutions they got. You'll notice that there was just the one radical in the equation. The first thing they did was they added this one over here and made it a four. And then after that, they were like, oh, well, we can just cube both sides. The cube and the cube root cancel, and that's how they got 64 equals this. Wonderful quadratic where they could solve it through factoring. Um, if you feel like you spend half your life trying to figure out if it even factors or not, remember you have some ways to get around that. You could just check the discriminant to see if it factors. Um, you can also always use quadratic formula, I guess. All right, so remember, if I have a radical, if I can isolate it, that would be awesome. So let's go ahead and isolate it real fast. So we have the cube root. I'm trying to hurry up and get some examples done because my algebra kids are about to come in. And don't forget, this is the cube root in the index. So to undo that cube root, we can just cube both sides. So this leaves me with x squared minus 1, and then 2 to the third power is 8. If I add the 1 over, and then I square root, I get x equals positive and negative 3. And then if I go back and plug them in and check, it turns out they're both great answers. So keep them both. Hey, good news. Two radicals, and they're already separated on each side of the equation. And they're square roots, so I'm going to go ahead and take the liberty of squaring both sides. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy, they just cancel. Um, we're going to solve, of course. So I'm going to subtract 6n. Does that feel like it? I'm going to add 15. I don't know if I'm going to give you one this easy, guys. Come on. No, we can't stop here because remember we talked about checking our solution. So, um, 70, I forgot what this is. <laughs> Heck. All right, 6 times 12. Square root of 69 and then negative 15 plus 7 times 12 is also going to be square root of 69. So while they're not pretty like check solutions, they do come up to the same answer, and that's all I care about. Remember, our rule is if there's a radical and he's the only one, just make sure nobody else is with him. So let's subtract this 21 over. And this is going to make your life a little better, I promise. Because once we square both sides here, you're not going to have any more radicals. Yes, you do have a bit of a foiling problem here, but we got this. All right, so 16x squared. I feel like I just did the foiling problem. 84, 168, right, x? And then that's... four forty one. And then over here, the square root and the square just cancel. 56 minus x. Got a lovely quadratic we're going to solve. Can't wait. 16x squared. Adding the x over negative 167x. Subtracting the 56. Oh, 385. Oh, gosh. Now, various methods of solving that quadratic. I guess I used quadratic formula because you know I wasn't about to factor that. So when I did quadratic formula, I ended up with something like 167 plus and minus 57 over 32. So it turns out, like, I guess I could have factored it, but, you know, I wasn't going to come up with those numbers. So when I solved these, I got x equals 7 and x equals, um, I think it says 55 over 16. But the reason I can't read it 
is because I ended up crossing this off because it turns out it's extraneous. So when I went to go plug it back in, um, and I tried to check it out, so like 4 times 55 over 6 and then subtract 21 ended up being a negative number. And I can't have a square root on one side equaling a negative number on the other, so I just got rid of it. And then 7 didn't check out. So. All right. Boy. Well, the good news is I'm really running out of time. <laughs> the bad news is this is a really long question. So I think I'm going to kind of cheat with you. Um, if you are doing this full out, I suggest you pause this video and you try to go through the first few steps on your own. Just FYI, I'm going to add this radical over here. So now would be a good time to pause the video and you try squaring both sides of this equation. It's going to be a good time. Now, for the rest of us, we're just kind of hanging in here. When I square both sides of this equation, square root and square cancel out, so that's easy. But this becomes a foiling question. So 1 times 1 is 1, and then I'm going to have two of these radicals added together, because 1 times 1 is 1. So 2, 4x squared uh, plus 9 under the square root. And then when I multiply a square root of 4x plus 9 times another square root of 4x plus 9, I get 4x plus 9. I mean, if we're doing this in class, I'm probably going to, like, really show my work, right? So um, combining my like terms here, that's a 10. So let's just say I subtracted 10 over here. And then while we're at it, if you don't mind if I subtract this 4x. So I have 2x. That's now a plus 2. And I still have 2 in front of this radical. Now, I see that there's a common 2. If you don't mind, I'm just going to divide everybody by a 2. Each divided by 2. So I get x plus 1 equals the square root. This just makes for my, like, my next step a lot prettier because look what happens when I FOIL this. Way nicer. All right, so we have x squared plus 2x plus 1. Oh. Okay, <laughs> plus 2x plus 1 equals square root square cancel, so 4x plus 9. And then we do have a quadratic, so I'm going to subtract 4x and 9. And then my work's going to pop up here. So I have x squared uh, minus 2x minus 8. Oh, thank goodness, something that factors after that last one. That's really like... This is a blessing, right? So we get two solutions, but I do have to be careful because it's possible that one of my solutions won't work. So when I went back and I plugged them in, spoiler alert, this one did not work. Um, plugging in a negative 2 uh, ended up, let's see, where's the issue? Oh, it's right here. If I plug in a negative 2 here, it gives me square root of 0 minus... Um, square root of 1, 0 minus 1 is not 1, so that's why that one didn't work out, but 4 did check out. So, um, so lesson learned. Two radicals together, real bad news to make sure they're separated. Don't be afraid you might have to foil twice throughout your work. Just be really, really, really careful that you don't pull in a bruzo and like write down the wrong number. Or you figure out you can't add in the middle of your question. And if you find out that you made a mistake like somewhere in your work towards the middle or top, just erase all of it and start from scratch. It's really not worth trying to like go through and fix every single little thing because if you were sloppy at the beginning of the problem, there's a good chance you were sloppy somewhere else. <laughs> so good luck.